kind of fits right in with the message. That's kind of how God works, the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm going to get Jeanette to give her word, and then she's going to pray for me before we begin. Okay, before I start, um, Allison, yeah. right? Um, God just showed me during worship um, that you're like a flower, but a few of your petals have been plucked out or fallen off, and you've thought that because of that, that you didn't, weren't as beautiful as you were before that. And God just wants you to know that, that you are actually more beautiful and that the... Um, like when the leaves were broken off, it, it's given a scent off that that is really precious, and you might not be able to feel that, but that God thinks you're beautiful even with the nicks in the butt. So I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Okay, so um, what God gave me during worship was um, I got a couple pictures, and one was going up a stair, a stair, the stairs. And so, you know, you start off going up and you're walking up and you're just doing fine. And then all of a sudden the boulders are coming down and, and life, because the stairway is a pathway of life, right? And so you're kind of down on your hands and knees and the boulders and the bits are all coming at you. And you're just kind of making it up the stairs. And then to the side, I, I saw the Lord and he was by a, um, just by a pool and he's just wiggling his finger in the pool. And it was like, just come aside and rest. And that, like when he was in the boat, he saw the storm and, the, and all the disciples were worrying about that. But he saw all the boulders of life. But he wants us to keep our eyes on him and, and he, it be in that rest, but life still happens. Does that make sense? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Father, so we just fill up Anna Marie this morning. And Lord, I just ask that you would tell our hearts that we wouldn't think, oh, gee, I've heard this word before or I've heard about Psalm 23. But Father, we pray that, that fresh seeds would be planted this morning and that you would just bring fresh revelation to Anna Marie, that even in her notes that you would add to, and Lord, that you would the, be the one that would just come through this morning. So we just pray that you would be her voice and that, Lord, we just pray anointing over her, we pray covering over her, and Father, we just come to receive, and may she feel us drawing that word out. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, it, it's Psalm 23, the Lord's my shepherd. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with that. But I've come across lately a, a new translation of the Bible, and I'm always a little bit like, hmm, I don't know about these new translations. How true are they to the original? And that's my, uh, yeah, I just, I'm just quite particular about that. So this one, we, I downloaded on my phone, and I'm listening to it. And when I heard this version of Psalm 23, I thought, oh, this is what David meant to say to me. This is how it helps me to understand. So I'm going to first read it. You can follow along in your Bible as if you want, but it's going to be different. So um, yeah, I'm going to read it first and then we'll go through it. Psalm 23. The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I will always have more than enough. He offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. His tracks take me on an oasis of peace, his quiet brook of bliss. That's when he restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along the footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to his name. Lord, even when your path takes me through the valley of the deepest, darkest darkness, fear will never conquer me because you already have. You remain close to me and lead me all the way through it. Your authority is my strength and my peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear. I'll never, ever be lonely, for you are always near. You, became, you become my delicious feast when my enemies dare to fight. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all that I can drink of you till my heart overflows. So why should I fear the future? For I am being pursued only by your goodness and your unfailing love. 
Then afterwards, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Isn't that lovely? I know. It's called the Passion Version. Um, that, yeah, when I first heard that, I just wept. I thought, Father, this is, this is beautiful. David, for those of you that don't know, David was a king, and he's the one that wrote the Psalms. He was a shepherd, and he spent a lot of time in the fields watching his sheep when he was younger. And uh, he wrote this then in his time. Shepherds did work, but lots of times they sat and watched the sheep. They were the guardians of the sheep. So the first, David spoke from a place that he understood. Often we, when we give testimonies, we want to speak from a place that we've journeyed. I can't tell um, Mike's testimony because I haven't walked his journey. I can't tell Brinley's testimony. I haven't walked her journey. But David speaks of his journey. And this version kind of helps me um, make it my journey. So this is, we're just going to kind of go through this. The Lord is my shepherd. No, the Lord is my best friend. He is my shepherd. And I will always have more than enough. You know, sometimes today, I know this whole Facebook thing, it drives me nuts. I got to tell you, I'm just about up to here with Facebook. But everybody's a friend. We've lost, I think, over the years, what does it mean to be a best friend? What does that mean? You know, every young person, every teenager, I, we all need people in our lives that we know that will stand by us when we're cranky, when we're feeling fat and ugly, when we're depressed, when we're happy, when we're grieving. Not a lot of people have that kind of a solid good friend. And David says here, the Lord is my best friend. And he's my shepherd. And the shepherd took care of the sheep. Sheep are not real. They're a little low on the intelligence scale. So sometimes I took a great insult that we were kind of referred to as sheep in the scripture. But now I kind of get it because we cannot understand everything that God has for us. So we need him to shepherd us and to guide us as a friend along this journey. And he says, when I know that, I will always, always have enough. If I'm in a place right now where I feel, don't I, I don't have enough, that's not God's problem. That's my problem. Somehow I've lost my connection with him. So, and I don't mean to minimize any journeys that you're going through, but it reminds us when, whenever I think, I'm, I don't have enough. I feel like the Holy Spirit's calling me into a special place with him so that I can be reminded that he always gives me enough. The next thing is, he offers a resting place for me in his luxurious love. When you, don't you love that word luxurious? I, I luxurious. When I, I, when I thought about that word, I closed my eyes and I thought, what's luxurious? So when I saw myself on these big red velvet pillows with blankets and fans and nobody was feeding me, unfortunately, but that's okay. You know, it was just, it was just so comfortable and I felt safe. I felt safe. And that's what David is saying. God says, come, I have this resting place for you and it's in my ex luxurious love. I, um... And then he says, his tracks take me to an oasis of peace, his quiet brook of bliss. And then he will restore, and that's when he restores and revives me. See, he says his tracks take me. That means I have to follow. Right? John's learning how to hunt. Oh, my, oh pardon me. John is a hunter. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, John. <laughs> And I, do you have to track things when you're hunting or do you just sit there and watch? You got to track things? Yeah, you got to track things. You look, you look for signs. You look for deer hooves. Is that deer hooves? I don't know what they hunt for. Yeah. Uh, deer hoof? Hoof. 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 <laughs> deer poop. Yeah. Oh, deer. Oh, no. yeah. deer. You look for deer hooves yeah. and you have to... <laughs> okay, focus. <laughs> You have to look for the tracks. 
You have to look for the tracks. And David says his tracks, God's tracks, take me to an oasis of peace. If you put luxurious and oasis in the same sentence, oh man, that just sound, does that not sound lovely? Like that sounds lovely to me. And his quiet brook of bliss. Then he restores my life and revives it. I think this is a day and age for us, especially in this time in our life. And I know people with young kids. You're so... What? Oh. How is this supposed to be taken serious? <laughs> Not the other thing. No, thank you. All right, that's... Anyway. Okay. Don't do that again. <laughs> When we walk through our journeys, right now, we're, we're in a pretty busy stage in our life. And, uh, and I think most of you can say, we're busy. And if we're not busy, we feel like we should be busy because everybody else is busy. And for Christians, somehow busyness is this lovely badge of honor that we can wear. Oh, I'm so busy. I'm doing this and this and this and this and this. And then I got to take my kids here and here and here and here. And then, of course, all the new shows on TV are coming. So I have to make sure that we record all of those. And then, and then, and then I have to date my wife. And I have to mow the lawn. And I have to do all these things. And I think what the fathers wants you to say this morning is, let's put some of that aside. Find out. Ask him, go to that oasis, that luxurious oasis, and ask him, what are the priorities that you have for me today? I forget to do that. I forget to sit and say, Father, what do you want me to do today? Not what does everybody else want me to do, but what do you want me to do today? Because I know from experience, and you'd think I would learn, but I somehow go back into it, that when he gives my agenda for the day, I get everything done and I'm not frazzled. I even have time to watch TV. You know, I have time to relax. So just take time, because you know what? The Father longs to have that time with you. It's not a I have to or I must do. The Father says, come with me. I'll organize your day. I'll revive you. I'll refresh you so that you can do the things that I want you to do today, that I want you to do today. And then once we do that, once we find out what he wants, you know what he does? He opens before us pathways of God's pleasure that leads us along his footsteps of righteousness so that we can bring honor to his name. Now, I don't know about you, but as a child of the Father, what's your deepest longing? I want to bring honor to his name the best way that I can. I don't want people to look at me and think, oh, some God she's got. I want to represent him well and bring honor to his name. And if I'm walking around so frazzled like a chicken without my head cut off, I, I get a little bit ugly. Like I get, like I'm not representing him very well at all. And I want you to know that um, he takes us into the pathways of his pleasure. And that's something he chose to do. Ephesians 1 verse 4 says that he chose us, all of us, in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ according to his good pleasure. He didn't look down from heaven at Adam and Eve and say, doggone it, they screwed up. Now i got to figure out how to make them my own again. That's a lot of work. That wasn't the heart of the Father. The Father says, I love you so much and I long for family. It's my good pleasure to call you my children and bring you into paths of righteousness. That makes God happy. That makes him happy. That fulfills. He looks at us and says, you are my joy. You are my longing. I have a love relationship with you. Just with you. It's, it's just so incredible. And then he says, Lord, even when your path takes me into the valleys of the deepest darkness, fear will never conquer me because you already have. You remain close to me and you lead me through it all the way. 
You know what I found interesting here? It doesn't say, if you lead me through the valley of the deepest darkness. It says, when you lead me through the valley. Not once has God ever promised that once we give our lives to him, that life's just going to be a walk in a park. And I know every person in this room has multiple valleys of deep darkness. Whether you live with mental illness or physical pain or you have marriage issues or you have a wayward child or man, I, financial issues. And nobody, I cannot say my deepest valley is worse than Carol's. I, I can't do that. We all have our own deep, darkest valley. Mike and I are um, going, going through a little bit of one right now. Um, Mike's dad, he's 88, and uh, so he's lived a good life, but he's just been diagnosed with um, stage four cancer. So we are busy um, doing around the clock sittings with him and just visiting with him, and, and it's an honor. It is truly an honor. And at the same time, it's exhausting. If you've done hospice care or, or um, sat with someone who's dying, it's, it can be emotionally draining. So that's the one thing. And the other thing that we've been dealing with for the last few months is one of our youngest sons has decided to have no contact with us for a while. Um, we, we don't know why. We're trusting him in, and his wife into the father's hands, but as a, as a parent, that's pretty painful. So, and I'm just asking that the father would show me when I've hurt him that deeply too. You know, and that I would seek forgiveness when I have put, pushed him to the side and not wanted his advice or his opinion or wanted him to share in my joys and in my sorrows. But even in the midst of that darkness, God is there. But I have to find him. Sometimes I want to sit in my chair and I just want to feel sorry for myself and I just want to cry. And then this ugly thing comes up. When I don't let the Father lead me through this valley, when I go on my own and I get afraid, oh, I can start, um, <laughs> I can get pretty ugly. Maybe not verbally, but in here. I can get quite, I can name call, and I can be judgmental. And I, when I let fear rule me, it's like I'm looking through the world with different glasses. And Karen could walk by me and didn't say hi, and I'm like, what the heck's her problem? Why didn't she say hi? Right? Or the driver in front of me forgets to blink and he doesn't do the signal. I'm like, what a freaking idiot. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It gets ugly. It affects when I let fear overcome my life. It affects my relationship with my husband and my children and my neighbors. And it affects the call that God has on my life. And it can come in so slowly. So slowly. Even as I was getting ready this morning, the Holy Spirit revealed things to me and I had to repent and say, Father, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that seeped into my heart. I didn't know. And once he forgives you, you feel so good, right? That's that oasis again. Once your forgiveness, once you feel his forgiveness, you're in his luxurious love, and that oasis comes again. Even Jesus had his deepest, darkest valleys, didn't he? Yeah. That garden of Gethsemane, when he's on his knees and saying, God, if there's another way, I have never sweat blood before. I've cried many tears, but never sweat. I've never been in that deep of agony. Even there, Jesus said, I wish there was another way. But he found his oasis, didn't he? He found his oasis when he said, not my will, but your will. So often I think, Lord, I just want to text my son and just say, sometimes I want to say I love you, other times I want to rip him apart. I was going to be honest with you, right? But God, in his mercy, he says, stay out of it. If you do this, you are interrupting my purposes in this plan. That has got to be one of the hardest things for me to do because I like to butt in. 
I like to fix problems. I like to say, hey, it's because of me he's back in the family. That's what I like to say. But when I stay out of it, and when God brings him back, guess who gets the glory? The father does. And I do have to tell you, once I argue with the father a little bit, then I'm ready to go into this peace place. And I'm so good with him taking care of it. But I have to remove, I have to, I have to find that place, just as Jesus did. We have to find that place and say, your will is what I really want most of all. Then, uh, where are we here? Hold on. Oh yeah, it says, sin can no longer conquer me because God already has. Don't you love that? I wrote that on the chalkboard in my house. Only one thing can conquer your heart. Conquer means complete control. I can't have two things conquering my heart. Right? So when we're believers and we receive the Holy Spirit and we give our lives to Jesus, God has conquered our hearts. Sin can come in and knock at the door. And he, he, it does. And I'll open it a little bit, and then a little more sometimes, and then that ugliness comes in, and I have to remember to slam that bloody thing shut and say, you will not conquer me because my God already has conquered me. And then I can, we can all rise up in that authority and say, God has conquered my heart. Take a hike. And I, it works. Sometimes I have to do it every three seconds. But it does work. It, it does work. And then the next verse says, Your authority is my strength and peace. The comfort of your love takes away my fear, and I will never be lonely when you are near. When, someone is, when something's conquered your heart, it has authority over your heart. Right? Yeah, it has authority over your heart. And we want to make sure that the Father's authority is what's reigning in our hearts. Nothing else. Nothing else. And I just, I just want to go back to this deepest valley a minute. I, I, when preparing, I just remembering now that it's okay to be in a dark valley. It doesn't mean you're a sinner. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. It doesn't mean that you need to buck up and get with it. That's, that's not what it means. Dark valleys are places where we grow. They suck, man. They suck so much. But if we keep hanging on, he's there. He's there and don't let anybody tell you that that's, a, that that's because, you know, because he doesn't love you anymore or your faith isn't strong enough or, because that's just lies. That's those lies from the enemy that can come in. There's a verse in Romans that says, for I know that all things work together for his good for my good and for his glory when we are called according to his purpose. When you're in that oasis of love, that luxurious oasis of love, listening to him, you're, you're in the center of his will. That's where he wants you to be. That's where he wants you to be. So all things in your life, bad or good, however dark it will be, it will work out for your good and for his glory. That is an incredible promise, folks. To me, that I hang on to that. When I'm dark, I say, this is going to be for your good. For my good and for your glory. For my good and for your glory. For my good and for your glory. And then you become a delicious feast, even when my enemies dare to fight. Is that my phone in my purse? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> You know the original verse says, you set a table before me in the presence of mine enemies? I never quite got that. I thought, I thought that was, like, I don't know. I didn't quite, I, thought, I don't get this. Like, I don't really understand this. But when he says, you become my delicious feast even when my enemies dare to fight. You know who my biggest enemy is? You, so. Me. I say things about myself that nobody ever would say, at least not to my face, that nobody would ever say. <laughs> I think thoughts. I think that people would think, oh, you don't think that. So yeah, my brain can go there. I can be my worst enemy. And you know what it says here? It said he's laid out a delicious feast before me. What's that feast? Everything that I need to fight my enemies is already here. 
it's already in me when I, when I seek him, when I find him, when I, when I live in his lap, when I let his luxurious love wrap around me. Everything I need to fight my enemies is already here. He's given it to us. We have that power, and often I don't use it. I let it. I, I, I'm a little bit of a wimp sometimes, you know? And I think, oh, yeah, I'm tired, you know? But we got to stand up and fight. We have to let our enemy know who's in control. And let that spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, rise up in us and say, I will not let the enemy conquer my heart. I won't let it happen. And then because we're resting in that love and we've, we have this delicious feast before us, he anoints my head with the fragrance of his Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink till my heart overflows. You know, I was preparing this and I thought of David and Claire. Most of you know that they make worship flags and those flags get sent all over the world. Ev everywhere, right David? They're all over the world. And uh, I was helping them for a few days, and I was watching. And do you know that before each flag goes in its shipping box, it gets anointed with a beautiful oil. It is a beautiful, beautiful fragrance. I even put some on my hands and put some on my ears. I, I just thought it smelled so nice. And can you imagine when the people that bought those flags opened up the box excited to see what they've purchased. What's the first sense that's going to hit them? The smell. The fragrance of that anointing oil that David and Claire put on those flags. Can you just feel it? Like I can feel it. Just like, wow. And that's what happens when we walk among unbelievers in each other. When we are anointed with the fragrance of the Holy Spirit, people can smell that on us. What's different about you? They can smell it in your home. We've had people come in our home and say, there's something different in this house. What's different here? You know, I don't know. I don't have potpourri going or nothing. And then the Spirit says, it's me. They can tell. I'm telling you, people can tell. Friday nights when we're here, people can tell that our volunteers have the fragrance of the Holy Spirit on them. You can just tell. It's indescribable. And it's undeniable. And that's what... Um, the Holy Spirit does for us. He anoints us with oil until, uh, until, and you give me all I can drink until my heart overflows. I'm a visual person, so I'm going to show you something here a minute. Hold on. Can you come, can you hold this for me? Or you can maybe pour. We get enough of God's love till overflows. This is God's love right here. Mike, you pour it in. Yeah, just in the middle. And he pours, and he pours, and it's getting heavy, hang on. <laughs> and he pours, keep going, just keep pouring. And he pours, when we're in his love, this is what happens when we're in his, his, his lap. He pours, keep going, he pours, he pours, and he pours, and he pours, and he pours. Look at that, and he pours, and he pours. <laughs> and he pours way more than I ever need. Way more than I'll ever need. And it's right there. It's, it's right there. Isn't that incredible? That's incredible that it's right at our disposal anytime we want it. And he gives us that so that we can be overcomers in this world and honor his name. The last part. So why should I fear the future? Why should I fear the future? For I am being pursued only by your goodness and unfailing love. You know what that means? That everything we go through, every valley, every darkness that we go through, we are always pursued by the goodness of God. He has a plan. It's not some haphazard thing, our life. He has a plan. He knows, to, he knows the exact day that our son will return to us. He knows the exact day that he's taking Mike's dad home. He knows. So why should I fear? Sounds easy. 
but not really, right? <laughs> Sometimes we have to push that fear out a thousand times a day. I have to push that fear out of someone. But one day, the Father's love is going to be like that, and there will be no more room for fear. You see, there's no room for fear in this one, is there? There's no room for fear. It's just his unfailing love and mercy. That's all we have room for. And we don't have to worry about the future. When we follow in his tracks, when we're resting in his luxurious love, when I allow him to conquer my heart, when I let comfort take away the fear, when he anoints me with the fragrance of the Holy Spirit, because when I allow these things to fill me and I understand how much he loves me, I'm being pursued by his goodness and his unfailing love. And then David says, and then afterwards, when my life is through, I'll return to your glorious presence to be with you forever. I've had moments like that in my life when I wish that was sooner than later. Depends how dark your valley is, right? How darkness your darkness is. And thank God they don't last forever. But in that moment, you think it would just, heaven just sounds wonderful. Doesn't heaven sound wonderful? And then we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Not well done because you've led so many people to me. And not well done because you've worked so hard and everybody knows it. And not well done because you've made a lot of money. Not well done till you've served, till you're exhausted. But well done because you chose to dwell in my love. That's the well done. That's what it is. So we're gonna, I'm going to get Jolene to play. We're going to just have a bit of a prayer call. If I could get um, the prayer people to come forward. We're having a celebration Sunday. So it's going to be a little noisy back there because we'll need people to set up some tables and do what we do back there. We're also going to need people to help clean up afterwards. But if I could have um, Arnie come forward. Wendy, would you pray today with people? You can say no. You don't have to. No? Okay, who else? Uh, Carol? Who's on the prayer team? I don't even know who's on the prayer team. Robert? Can you pray today? Or no? Yeah? All right. If this is a place, like there's so many avenues that we can seek prayer for in this psalm. But today what I think the Holy Spirit is saying, if you want this, if you want this, no room for anything else but his overflowing love this is your time to be blessed this is it you don't have to come with a long prayer request you just have to come here and these people are just going to lay their hands on you and they're going to ask the spirit of the living god to fill you up to overflowing come on patricia to fill you up to overflowing so there's no room for fear there's no room for judgment. There's no room for competition. Competition is a big one. And while we're praying, the rest, please, um, some men could set up some tables. And uh, yeah, so we just want to take time here. If you're feeling that you're fine, we could just get you to set some tables and chairs up. That would be great. Thank you.